Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanya Gierke, and my husband Paul and I have been serving in Romania for seven years with the NAB conference. And it's crazy to think that it has been seven years, but that means seven years of us digging in with the mission that the Hungarian Baptist Convention is on here in Romania. And it means seven years of developing Camp Falcon Rock, which is the main ministry that we are a part of. And it means seven years of you guys faithfully partnering and coming alongside of us in this mission. And so we are so grateful for each and every one of you for your prayers and for your support of the work that is happening here in Romania and the way in which you are influencing the kingdom advancing work that is happening here through the mission of the NAB in Romania. So thank you for partnering with us in that way. Uh, we have a lot to update you on. Uh, it's been a while since we've been back in Canada, mainly because of this pandemic that's been going on. Um, but we haven't been able to see you for a while and, and we're sorry for that. So we want to give you a little bit of an update of what's been happening for us with the ministry. Uh, obviously COVID has been a huge thing that we've been facing as well on the mission field. Uh, things were a little bit crazy for us in March 2020 when the whole world shut down. The same was for us here in Romania where we needed a permit even to go outside for a walk. We weren't allowed to go for a walk on the street without a government permit. That's how intense the restrictions were. But slowly they have been lifting and now we're able to run with ministry um, like normal. And so we're, we're grateful for that. But in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of all the lockdowns and the restrictions, we saw God faithfully working in our midst and we saw his grace upon us in big ways. Uh, one of the major projects that we're working on at the camp is building the main lodge. This main lodge is a huge project. It's going to house about 300 people for dining. It's a massive build. It has a kitchen attached to it. It has office spaces. Um, and so it's a big project that we've been working on. We started that in spring of 2020 with the expectation that we'd be running summer camps. And we're actually pretty grateful that we didn't have kids running around the property as we had this giant pit uh, on Camp Falcon Rock where we had dug out the area where the main lodge would be built. So we saw God's grace on us in that. Um, and in the midst of that, we got a lot of work done. We are so grateful to, to let you know that in the midst of the pandemic, with everything shutting down, we did not have to stop work at Camp Falcon Rock and we didn't have to let go any of our local staff. So throughout the pandemic, we were able to continue to employ Thomas and Tunda, who are the national missionaries of NAB, they are the camp director and camp administrator, as well as a number of local um, workers who help us with construction and operations at the camp. As the ministry has been developing, there's been this need um, for more workers to come, which is a great need to have. And so we've been able to hire more construction workers, more operation workers, and in that we've actually taken on a new missionary family with the NAB. The Bergman family, they were appointed right when that lockdown happened in March 2020. Uh, and they spent that whole year fundraising to come to the field. This is a huge blessing for us um, because both Jason and Aaron have a huge heart for camp ministry. Jason worked as an engineer in Canada, but him and Aaron worked at a number of uh, camps in Canada throughout the summer doing leadership training um, and being involved in camp ministry. And so they bring a huge expertise to what is going on at Camp Falcon Rock. And we're so grateful to announce that they were able to fundraise through the pandemic and make it over to Romania May 17th of this last year. And they made it just in time for the exciting thing that happened and that is Summer Camps 2021. Uh, we were so grateful to be able to open up the doors of Camp Falcon Rock again as of January as the government restrictions lifted uh, and we were able to see a number of groups come in throughout the spring where we had leadership conferences, worship conferences, discipleship training programs and then this summer we were able to open up for full-time summer camp ministry. So we just finished four weeks of Camp Falcon Rock programming over the month of July. The first week was our leadership training where we trained all of the volunteers that were coming to work for Camp Falcon Rock this summer. Uh, this summer was unique. We did not have the usual assistance of mission teams coming over, which is a huge support to us. Um, but it, it created this opportunity where we were able to develop more local leaders in that. And so we had a week where we trained our young adults who we've been discipling over the past seven years to be the camp counselors, the sports leaders, the craft leaders. Uh, and it was just a really impactful time to see them grow in their faith and grow in their leadership abilities. Uh, then the next three weeks we had camp programs. We had 45 young people on the property. We had middle school age kids, we had teenagers, we had young adults all coming to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Our theme this year was anchor. What does it mean that we have an anchor in our lives who is Jesus Christ looking at the passage of Hebrews 6. And it was really incredible to see the impact that uh, the camp ministry had on the young people that came to camp this summer. We saw young people give their lives to the Lord. We saw testimonies of um, people who 
who have grown up in the church, that have grown now in their understanding of who Jesus is and what it means to anchor their entire lives in Christ. And so overall, it was just a powerful testimony to God's faithfulness to be working through the ministry of Camp Falconrock and reaching young people with his love. So a lot has been happening for us. There's a lot to, to share. Um, we want to share a little bit more with you, but give you a little more of a visual of what's been going on um, here at, in Romania at Camp Falcon Rock. And so we have a little video to show you that gives you a, a general overview of all the building development and all the ministry that's taken place at Camp Falcon Rock over the last seven years. We did this video actually last spring, um, 2020. So some things have changed, like the main lodge is way further along. And I'm gonna show you a couple clips of that right now. Um, so we've been able to, to progress further with the main lodge building, getting the foundation up, getting the walls up. And then there's also another project that you'll see called the Root Cellar, which has been developed into a cabin. We took this old root cellar where we used to store our potatoes um, for the camp and we've developed into another fully functional cabin for the camp and we were able to use that this summer. So we hope you enjoy this video uh, to get a, a grasp of what's been happening at Camp Falcon Rock. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for partnering with us in this way. Welcome to Camp Falcon Rock. Uh, it's hard to believe, but this ministry has been developing and in operation for six years now. And just thinking about where we were six years ago to where we are now, it's incredible. We know we get the common question of what does it all look like? What's happening at Camp Falcon Rock? And so we want to give you a virtual tour of the property here and share about the ministry. But first, we're going to take a step back and figure out where is Camp Falcon Rock in the world? The ministry of Camp Falcon Rock is located in Romania, which is in Eastern Europe. Uh, the exact site of Camp Falcon Rock is in Transylvania in the Northwest region. It's strategically located right in the heart of our Hungarian Baptist churches and villages that allows us to effectively build the kingdom in this region. Now join us as we take a tour of Camp Falcon Rock. So we're here in the staff housing area of Camp Falcon Rock. The one behind us is occupied by Vern and Gloria Wagner, who are NAB missionaries helping with construction and operations of the camp. We have both international and local staff. Thomas and Tunda are the camp directors. We have eight other local staff that have been hired to help us with operations and camp development and ministry programs. I'm sitting here on the balcony of one of our newest projects on the go, which is converting this old root cellar into a cabin to create more space for campers to come and attend our programs. Long term, it's going to serve as a little retreat house for pastors or couples or individuals to come and find rest and rejuvenation. But my all-time favorite part is that view behind me. Where I'm sitting right here is the spring that provides water to the entire property of Camp Falcon Rock. This project was a massive project. Somebody compared it to developing a water and sewage system for an entire subdivision in a North American city. This allows us to host hundreds of people at one time at Camp Falcon Rock, and it's good, clean water that I can drink right now. Uh, follow along with us. Let me take a sip of water, and we're gonna go check out our campfire. If you've been to summer camp before, then you know the campfire spot is a pretty special place where God speaks about his love and calls people to follow him into his mission. And that's what this place represents for us. We've seen campers give their lives to the Lord and find out how God is calling them into his kingdom mission. This is the sports and recreation area of Camp Falcon Rock, and it allows us to play a number of sports. Beyond that, it allows us to break down barriers, to develop relationships, uh, so that we can get to know these kids and youth better. Uh, keep following along with us as we head to the existing building. This right here is our main building on site where we have our kitchen, our dining room, where we can feed everybody that delicious Hungarian cuisine. This building was actually a little farmhouse that came with the purchase of the property and we renovated it into this lodge so that we could begin active ministry while still working on the development of the rest of Camp Falcon Rock. Right behind me is one of our cabins. We have two duplex cabins which allows us to host 40 campers right here at these cabins. 
Uh, our desire is to build six more that allows us to have 120 more campers on site. Last year, these cabins were full and as I had the opportunity to engage in cabin times with the campers and hear their questions and share the good news of who Jesus Christ is, we saw lives changed right here in these places. Standing here at the site of what's going to be the future main lodge. As you can see, work has already begun on this massive project. This building is going to provide us with a space to host up to 300 campers for conferences and retreats, and it's going to help extend the kingdom ministry that's already taking place at Camp Falcon Rock. This is a large undertaking and will require a big community of support to see this all happen. Thank you for joining us on this tour of Camp Falcon Rock. Thank you for hearing the stories of impact going on in the ministry. Uh, if you want to be a part of what's going on here in Romania, if you want to be a part of a life-changing project like this Main Lodge project, would you visit us at rootsinromania.com to find out how. Good morning, Rose of Sharon Baptist Church. Uh, I want to welcome you to Romania. Uh, that's where I'm standing. Uh, Romania is very rural based and I'm standing out in the field surrounded by the sunflowers, surrounded by the corn, the, the wheat, the, the fruit trees, right outside of the village that Tanya and I have been living in now for seven years. Uh, it's hard to believe that we've been here for seven years now. It's hard to believe there's about seven and a half years that we came to visit you all. Um, and I remember that time that God called us to Romania. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit this morning with you, is God's calling on our lives. Um, the, the first time I felt called to Romania was um, in 2012. And I remember sitting at, a, at an event and the Lord sort of speaking to me in that moment of, of really clarifying that maybe was, I was being called to go kind of sell everything I owned, leave everything I owned, and with my wife Tanya, for the two of us to move to Romania. Uh, Tanya had felt that call uh, months before that when we were in Romania, and I remember her coming to me and saying, I think God's calling us to move to Romania, and as a good husband, as a good follower of Jesus, I said, uh, I don't see that call at all. Um, but that was what God was calling us to. And months later, he was, he was recalling me to that, and he was gracious. And, and I remember in that moment, in this event, just saying, there's no way. I, I can't do it. I, I can't respond to that call. It's, it's too hard. It's, it's, it's too difficult to leave our friends and our family. I was pastoring a church in, in Canada, and it was a great church, and Tanya was a teacher. And, uh, and, and it was just hard to leave that. Um, and, and there's a call that we see in the Old Testament, um, a call to Abraham by God. And, and that's what I want us to think about for a couple minutes this morning. As God called Abraham thousands of years ago, as call, God called me, you know, 10 years ago to Romania, as maybe God is speaking to you and calling you today. Uh, what is that calling? And, and how do we respond to that calling? Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want us just to look at three verses from Genesis chapter 12. And, and I want to share stories about God's calling and his faithfulness of calling us to, to ministry, to follow him, um, and his, his ongoing faithfulness to provide for us, his ongoing faithfulness to, to lead us, his ongoing faithfulness to, to direct us where we ought to go. And, and that's not just for pastors, that's not just for missionaries, but that's for all of us as disciples. And so what does it mean to, to, to follow him? What does that look like in our lives? And that's, that's what I want you to think about. That's what I'm thinking about. And, and I want to just share both from the word and testimonies of God's ongoing grace and faithfulness and his calling in our lives and, and what that can mean for you today too. And so a couple of verses I want us to read. Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. And this is God's calling on a man named Abraham. His name was Abram at the time when God called him. Um, but we all know him as Abraham. It says in, in Genesis 12, verse 1, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
So it was a very specific call for Abraham. It was a very difficult call for Abraham. And, and I just want us to look at three things um, within, within this calling for Abraham and, and how that relates to our life and what God's been doing here in Romania. And, um, the, the first thing within this call um, was this idea of forsaken, this idea of leaving something. What does he say to Abraham? Go from your country. So leave your country. And he says, leave your people and leave your father's household. Um, this wasn't an easy call for Abraham. He, he has to leave everything. First, he, God's saying to him, leave your country. So everything you know, everything you're familiar with. Uh, I remember when Tanya and I left Canada and we, we moved to Romania, and that was difficult. We had to leave the language of, uh, that we normally speak, spoke. I don't even speak it very well anymore, but we had to leave that language. We had to leave our culture and the types of food we eat. We had to, to leave all of that. We had to leave McDonald's. Uh, that was hard. All these things that we we're so familiar with and comfortable with, God's saying, now leave that behind uh, for a new land, for a new country. Uh, the second thing he says to Abraham was, um, leave your people. And, and I remember that for Tanya and I, leaving our friends, uh, our small group, our church. It's not an easy call. It wasn't for Abraham. And then he says to Abraham, leave your father's household. And, and, and this is significant in the time of, of Abraham's time because leaving your father's household meant leaving your provision. It, it meant leaving all of that which your, your provision was coming from. That was coming from your father. So he's saying, you're not going to get your wealth and your security any longer in, in your father and, and, and in that, but you're going to leave and I'm going to provide for you. And so I want you to, to forsake that and, and leave that. And again, I remember for Tanya and I, that same call of forsaking that was, was difficult to say, how's God going to provide for us? You know, we had regular jobs with regular incomes and now God's calling us to move around the world and leave that behind. Um, and yet, when we think of this idea of forsaking something, of, of leaving something behind, um, I, I don't want you to look at our example. Uh, I don't even necessarily want you to think about Abraham's example. I want you to think about the greatest example we see of this. And, and that's the, the example of Jesus Christ. That um, the essence of the gospel, as we read about with Jesus, is him coming down to this earth. Philippians chapter 2 talks about um, about him being taking on the very nature of a servant. Uh, that as Jesus came to live amongst us, to dwell amongst us, it was in that sacrifice, it was in the forsaking of some things to be amongst us that, that life and salvation and, and love was found for us. We know that. We know that that's the essence of, of the gospel is in the incredible sacrifice of Jesus Christ coming to this earth we can now have life. And so Jesus demonstrates for us. He, he, he lives this out for us. And so for us, when we look at that, that's, that's the same call we have to, to forsake some of the things in this world to, to follow him. We, we read a story that's, that's very popular and, and we know it well, but in Luke chapter 18 about this young man that comes to Jesus and, and he asks the question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? You know, and he's, he talks about all the good things he's doing, about following the Ten Commandments, about knowing the law well. Jesus looks at him, and what does he say? He says, I want you to sell everything you own and follow me. Um, and, and this rich young man looks at Jesus, and he goes away dejected and sad because he can't do it. He can't forsake the things of this world to, to follow Jesus. Now, um, I don't know if, if the Lord's going to look at you and say, I want you to move to Romania or to another country. I don't know if he's going to look at you and say, you need to go sell everything you own. But, but there's certainly things in our lives that, that Jesus looks at us and the Lord looks at us and speaks to us and says, you gotta, you got to leave that behind. There's, there's a new life that's found in the kingdom. There's this new life that's found in me that means leaving behind the things of this world. And, and so for Tanya and I, that certainly was leaving behind Canada to, to come to Romania. But I ask the question for you, what, what is that for you? What's God saying to you that you need to leave behind? May it be sin issues, may it be some, a relationship, may it be some things of this world where he's looking at you and saying, leave that behind. And, and again, the greatest example of this certainly was Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. That's the first thing that, that God says to Abraham is, is forsake. And then the second thing is, I'm very thankful for, for the second piece because he doesn't just leave Abraham there. 
And he says this at the end of verse 1, Go to the land that I will show you. So he does call him to forsake something, but now he says, I will go with you to this new land. I will lead you into this new land. Um, For Tanya and I, certainly that was following him to Romania, but this call to follow is, is universal throughout the Gospels. It's amazing if you were to open up the Gospels and looked how many times this phrase of follow me is in the Gospels. It's, it's an incredible amount of times. Jesus constantly is looking at people saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. Uh, there's a great story of Jesus looking at one of, one of the disciples, a man by the name of Levi. And he looks specifically at Levi and he says, Levi, come and follow me. And it's a profound calling that, that he would look at Levi because Levi was not a disciple at that time. Levi was not a religious leader at that time. Levi was not a, um, a religious man of, of any sense that we know of at that time. What was Levi? Levi was this tax collector. He was this sinner. Um, tax collectors certainly in the time of Jesus were not um, good, good men. Um, and so people didn't like tax collectors. They were outcasts. Maybe they still are today, but certainly they were a little more unethical now or then than they are now. But Jesus looks at him. He says, come and follow me even to a man like Levi, who's this tax collector, who's this sinner. And, and so I think Jesus looks at each and every one of us and he says, come and follow me. Whether you're a tax collector and sinner and you're far from me, or, or whether you've been in church and, 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 and you know the word of God and you've been born again, there's this call for us to follow him, to look to him. And that's exactly what God says to Abraham. Go to the place that I will show you. Follow me there. Uh, I remember when we moved over to Romania, just the, the peace and the comfort is as, as stressful as that time was and as worrisome as it was to leave our family and friends and move to a new land, how there was peace in that season. And the reason there was peace in that season was because God was leading us. He knew where we were going. He knew what was ahead of us. He knew uh, all the, the realities of, of what, would, what would come. Um, when we first moved to Romania in the first couple months, um, I don't know if you, if you heard this story, but uh, we have this boiler in, in our basement, and that's what heats our home, and we heat our home with wood. Um, and, and there was some noise going on in the boiler, and I know very little about boiler systems, because in Canada we have a furnace, and we turn it on, thermostat hits 20 degrees, and the, the furnace turns on. In Romania, you have to go down and put more wood on, um, and it's this pressurized system. It's a very interesting system, and and I remember going down there because I heard some noise and I'm a man, I thought I could fix it. And, and I look at it and there's a pressure gauge and the pressure gauge is much too hot. I knew very little about pressure gauges and very little about how to handle these pressure gauges. Um, but all I knew is I was a man and I probably needed tools in my hand to fix it. That's what men do, they hold tools when they fix things. Didn't know what I would do when I got a tool. So I said, okay, I'll leave, I'll leave the room, the, the boiler's in our basement, I'll leave that, go get a tool and come back. And, and I left that, the basement and I closed the door behind me and in one instant there was an explosion and I was on the ground and the boiler blew up and there was water and steam and fire everywhere and got up and I was disoriented and confused and the lights were out because the power cut out and I ran upstairs and Tony comes out and meets me and she said, what happened? And I said, I don't know. I'm covered in, in glass and blood and water and it's a scary moment. Um, and I remember after we kind of cleaned up the fire and took care of the situation, Tanya and I sat down and we just prayed and spent time with the Lord and this real sense that God was with us, this real sense that God was close to us, that even in the midst of this chaos, even in the midst of this suffering, even in the midst of this, this bizarre moment, God was close to us, that we had followed him to Romania and he was going to be close to us no matter what was going to happen. And so do we believe that? Are we willing to follow the Lord in the midst of that and and following is is has this idea of devotion are we are we truly devoted to the Lord are we truly devoted to his calling in our lives um, one of my one of my heroes of the Old Testament is a guy that most of us don't know about and his name's Ittai the Gittite try and say that 10 times fast Ittai the Gittite uh, and I love him because it's it's this great story of this time in David, King David's life. And what's going on at that time is King David is uh, he's getting older. He's got a son by the name of Absalom. Absalom is wanting to come and take over from his, his father, which means he's probably going to kill him to take over. King David sees this rebellion happening. So what does he do? He, he runs to the hills. He, he goes to the caves and he, he hides. Now, there's some mighty men, Ittai being one of them, that, that go with David. 
And, and, and David looks at Ittai. And, and he says to Ittai, go back. Go back with Absalom. Follow Absalom. And he wasn't saying that in a bad way. He just, David knew that he was going to die. He thought he was going to die, that this rebellion would succeed with Absalom. And he looks at Ittai and he just says, go back and, and, and be with Absalom. Go on the stronger side. And, um, and I want us to look at this really quickly. In 2 Samuel verse 15, um, Ittai says something very profound, very specific to David and, and when we think about this idea of devotion, when we think about this idea of following, this is this is really at the heart of it. And so David says, Why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom. And then Ittai says this in 2 Samuel 15, verse 21. But Ittai replied to, replied to the king, As surely as the Lord lives, and as my Lord the king lives, wherever my Lord the king may be, wherever whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. And this is why I love Ittai, because we just see his devotion. We see his heart to follow David, but even more than that, his heart to follow the Lord. He says, even if it means life or death, no matter the results, no matter the circumstances, this isn't going to be easy. This isn't going to be simple, but I'm going to follow you. Abraham, we, don't, we know for Abraham it wasn't an easy call to follow. And there's this call for us to say, are we going to follow no matter the circumstances, no matter the situations, are we willing to follow? Um, for Tanya and I, being in Romania, there's been a lot of really good moments. There's been obviously a lot of hard moments. And you constantly come back to that, that call and that devotion of, of following. And, and, and then the first number of years of, of applying for permits for the camp and of building relationships and uh, of all of these things, just saying, is it worth it? Was this the call? Is this what we're actually called into? Uh, and, and the question is, um, are we really willing to follow? Uh, and it takes time and it, and it goes over a series of years, but, but we see the results of that. And we see the results of that even with Abraham. And this is the third thing I want us to look at. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, it says, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you all will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Th this is the result of forsaking your old life. This is the result of, of following. The result is that, that you're a blessing uh, to the nations. Now, it, it's, it is a profound thing when we look at what... Um, what God was saying to Abraham, because it says, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I'll curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Here's the question that I want you to think about. How is it possible that all the peoples on earth were blessed through Abraham and his decision to forsake and to follow? How is that possible? As you think about the answer to that question, I, I want to lead you to a passage in scripture that probably you read daily, something that you look at often. Uh, it's a genealogy, right at the beginning of Matthew. Um, I, I know you get up in your morning devotions and you love reading genealogies. That's the first place you go to. But there's this genealogy. Uh, and when you look at the genealogy in Matthew, it begins with who? Abraham. And who does it end with? Jesus. It begins with Abraham and it ends with Jesus. And, and that tells us something so profound about the, the obedience and the following that Abraham had, that through his line, that through his people, Jesus Christ would come. And who's the blessing to the nations? It's, it's Jesus Christ. Who's the only one that can save? It's Jesus Christ. That, that's the blessing to the nations. And, and, and so when we think about our call to follow and to, to forsake our lives, if we know Christ, as, as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if we've been reconciled to Christ, if we've been uh, redeemed in Christ, we get to go be uh, ministers of reconciliation. And again, that's not just for pastors. That's not just for missionaries. That's for anyone who's been redeemed. That we get to go be uh, ministers of reconciliation. We get to go be a blessing to the nations. Why? Because Christ is a blessing to the nations. Um, we, we've had the blessing to see that uh, even in Romania uh, over these last number of years as, as the camp has grown and as we've seen youth grow up and now become leaders and as we see young people come to the camp now and you know after years of applying for permits and years of building um, to see the fruit now seven years in is is incredible 
to see how, how God is transforming the hearts and the lives of people. Um, you know, and even this past summer, praying with a number of people who gave their lives to the Lord. Um, we get to see that fruit now um, because of that. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a story, and this is where, where I'll end, but it reminds me of a story of when I was young. And, and when I was young, uh, one of the greatest things about summer uh, was the ice cream truck. Um, and, and I don't know if the ice cream truck still comes through British Columbia as it did in Alberta, but when I was young, you know, you'd be sitting on your couch, and all of a sudden the ice cream truck would come, and you'd hear the music, and you'd, you'd get out of the couch, and you'd ask your mom for some money, and you'd go out the front door, and, and you'd try and find where that music was. And you'd go sort of from subdivision to subdivision or street to street trying to find the, the ice cream truck. And I remember finally you'd, you'd get to the street and you'd see something and there's a bunch of kids eating ice cream. And, and you'd go up to them and you'd be like, where's the ice cream truck? And they'd look at you and they'd say, oh, it's the next street over. And then you'd run through the homes and to the other side of the street and you'd get there and there'd be more kids eating ice cream. And you'd look at them and you'd be like, where's the ice cream truck? And they'd be like, oh, go left. It's in that next street. And you'd turn the corner and there would be the, the ice cream truck. And there'd be this great moment of finally getting the ice cream truck. But, but imagine going to those first kids and running up to them and saying, where's the ice cream truck? And they sort of just look at you and say, doesn't matter anymore. I got my ice cream. Who cares about your ice cream? I mean, they wouldn't do that. And yet so often, I think for us, we, we, we look at it this way. We, we've been saved. We've been redeemed. We've found Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have that attitude of, well, I've experienced that. It's a new life that I have. But, but we got to be those ministers of reconciliation that are constantly telling people where the ice cream truck is, pointing people to Jesus Christ, our only Savior and, and only Redeemer. And, and so that's what I want to challenge you with today as you think about your call into missions. Uh, even if, if your missions is just right there in British Columbia, what does it look like for you to forsake? What do you got to forsake? What does it look like for you to follow? And, and what does it look like for you to be um, a, a minister of reconciliation that, that we're called to as we step into ministry? And, um, and, and so... Um, we want to thank you for allowing us to be a part of your service this morning. We want to thank you so much for your ongoing love and support and prayer. That means so much. Um, lives are changing and the kingdom is being built in Romania all because of your ongoing support. And we want to thank you for that. Um, and we want to finish this, this little presentation this time by showing you a video of, of all the ministry that was going on just this summer at Camp Falcon Rock and the lives that were changed, the testimonies of, of hearts that were turned towards the Lord and um, kids that, that got to know the Lord all because of uh, our partnership in the gospel together. So we want to thank you for that. We pray for you. We love you. And hopefully we'll be able to see you all again soon.
this summer we were able to step back on the grounds of Camp Falcon Rock and have four weeks of camps. The first week was, was staff training as we got our local leaders all prepped and ready to help lead the camp and then three weeks worth of kids camps and youth camp. We were able to again see hundreds of people back at camp property hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. This summer we dug into the theme from Hebrews about what is our anchor, our anchor being firm and secure in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And coming out of a year of turmoil where the, the storms of life certainly were evident in all of our lives around the world, we, we came back to that founding message of who Christ is and how He anchors us to something that's firm and secure. And we saw this in, in young people who were 12 and 13 years old when we first arrived. We were able to see this summer be our program leaders and counselors and even speakers. And these leaders, we witnessed as they sat with kids and prayed with kids and shared the message with kids. And the fruit of that was seeing these young people come to the Lord, give their lives to the Lord. And at the end of the week, as many young people shared testimonies, they shared that testimony of putting their faith and their hope and the security in the anchor of Jesus Christ. Oh, no.